So welcome to our seminar today. Because I'm also technical, I may step in as other people join in and add them into the seminar. Uh, so just want to make you aware of that. Uh, so you know, just bear with me as uh, I juggle the multiple hats uh, and, uh, and educate you and hopefully empower you with techniques today that will help you walk with confidence and peace of mind. A little bit about me, I'm Alexandria Diamond, your host and founder of Diamond Self-Defense and Fitness. I have over 25 years experience in the self-defense health and fitness industry. And over the last couple of years, uh, with my training and experience, I've been able to travel actually around the world, uh, training uh, men and women in self-defense, uh, fitness, and other elements. But as I was traveling, one thing that I learned and noticed through the various seminars I took myself as part of my training is that a lot of these seminars are taught by men, great, amazing instructors, but they don't necessarily have the comprehension of the differences that women face. Not just in the fact that our physical statures are built differently than most men, but also the fact that just our daily lives and routines and challenges we face are things that they're not familiar with. So even with their best intentions in studying, they don't have the experience of what it's like to try to walk in a pair of high heels or you know, juggling children or being pregnant or in those challenges. So while they teach great seminars and great content, it's not as specific to the challenges and things that we often have to overcome which is why the last couple of years, I've really narrowed down to working exclusively with women because I have that experience of understanding. Many times through many of the trainings and certifications I've done, I would find myself challenged with some of the techniques and this is what I do full time. And I thought, man, if I'm struggling with this, when this is all I do, how is someone who is learning self-defense just for their safety in their everyday life going to be able to incorporate this into their personal protection. And again, that is, that's kind of what led me down that path. I am a fifth degree black belt. I've trained in Krav Maga, which is my primary art, uh, Muay Thai, Brazilian Jiu Jitsu, as well as many uh, other traditional martial arts. Uh, that was actually where I started my martial arts career was in traditional martial arts. And, and then I learned that as great as those arts are, there's a lot of gaps when it comes to today's world's self-defense, which is what attracted me to things like Krav Maga and Hagana and those more real world practical self-defense techniques. So I want to give you just a little understanding of where I come from and why I do that. I now currently teach in Webster at uh, my gym during the day, but then I also offer virtual programs, both uh, on demand, meaning you can basically learn self-defense on your schedule when it works best for you, rather than trying to schedule like, okay, today's class at 9.30. But then I also do offer live virtual options for those who would rather have a more interactive experience. Uh, and then as I mentioned before, in-person classes, personal training, I teach women's self-defense seminars for uh, corporations, organizations, et cetera. So, I really love what I do. I'm very blessed to have this opportunity and nothing excites me more than when I finish a seminar, seeing the empowerment in women's body language. I mean, you can see when they start, you know, kind of that nervous, what's to be expected. And almost at some point during the seminars, uh, I'll see a light bulb go off in women's minds and you can literally see the physical stature change as they learn these techniques. And especially with the opportunity with in-person training, because I do a lot of drills that are designed to empower you and teach you what you're capable of. So almost like putting you under a little bit of stress, challenging you, raising the bar. And then when you see the success you have in those moments, it's incredibly exciting and empowering. So the first thing I wanna share with you today is that everyone is responsible for their own personal safety. Oftentimes when I travel and just talk to women at different events, you know, most women have a great understanding that, that they're the ones that have to be responsible for their own safety. But, but I have met women who, I mean, I remember one specific moment uh, that just stands out to me, this woman that I was talking to at a business networking event, and I actually had not mentioned, you know, you should come take class, but she immediately had to tell me like, oh, I, I don't need self-defense, I have a son, and he's tall. And I remember thinking to myself like, okay, but he's not here with you right now. Like when you walk from your car, from here to your car right now, God forbid something should happen. Like, what is your son gonna do to help you? But unfortunately, people get these naive, naive senses of security and I get it. Like we don't wanna be walking around every day thinking like, oh no, what if I'm attacked? And that's not what my goal is. My goal is to make it so you don't have to feel that way so that you can feel peace of mind. 
so that you can feel confident. Sometimes people will say things like, oh, well, you know, I don't really go anywhere by myself. Or I don't go to dangerous neighborhoods or, you know, I'm sure somebody will step in and help me out. Well, you know, let me tell you, that's not true. And I'm going to show you a video in a moment, which you probably have already seen because it's been on the news lately. But I can tell you countless stories of women who didn't get help. As a matter of fact, a lot of research I do for my self-defense training to understand the kind of situations that are out there are from videos people took of someone being attacked, which means someone was there watching the situation happen. And it was more important for them to capture the moment on video than it was to intervene and help those individuals that were in distress. So unfortunately, if you ever find yourself in that situation, odds are pretty high, someone will be recording it before they even consider intervening. Uh, so you need to own it. You need to recognize you are the only person who can read your situations, who can worry about your own personal protection. And if you have children, that also means you are the person who is responsible for making sure they're safe in various situations. So as part of this, I wanted to share a video. And again, I, I, you've probably already seen it because it has been on the news uh, of the woman that was attacked recently. And I wanna show you how the bystanders responded. So let's see. It's here, this should work. So let's see, I think this should start us right where the uh, thing leads off. As you can see, this woman right here is brutally attacked by this gentleman. And right here is a security guard watching it happen. He doesn't intervene, he doesn't get involved. And, and this is, news article talks a little bit more about who the uh, assailant is and why. But the important thing is what happens next is more disgusting than anything else, which is, is why there's a big thing. They close the door. They closed the door. Now we can look at this right now and talk about how, you know, it could be in regards to racism or other issues, but it doesn't matter why they close the door. The point is nobody intervened. This big, strong guy who, I mean, I've met a lot of security guards in my years training people in Krav Maga. Most of them are quick to brag about how they're the tough guy in the room, about how people count on them for safety. As a matter of fact, a lot of times I'll have someone say, oh, my good friend's a security guard, and he told me X, Y, Z. But in the moment when his job, his job, his career was needed, he watched. He watched. He didn't do anything. He didn't want to be bothered. And what they did, rather than help a 65-year-old woman, was close the door. There is no reason that couldn't happen to any one of us in any scenario. And that is why we have to know how to handle ourselves. We have to know how to protect ourselves. We cannot count on someone else to come through for us if we're in a situation of peril or distress. Uh, there are many other stories like this where, like I mentioned before, people just watched. Recently, at York Beach, Maine, a man beat his girlfriend, and there were bystanders. And again, nobody intervened. But you're here today because you do understand that you need to have a plan of action. You need to know how to defend yourself. You need to know what to do if you find yourself in that kind of situation. So the first thing we need to think about is, you know, COVID changed things for a little while. And so maybe our heightened sensitivity to self-defense isn't as high. I just want to make sure there's, okay, all right, that's there. Um, you know, we're, we're not as, you know, awake, as mindful or conscientious, but already as the world is reopened, what have we been seeing on the news? More attacks like the one that happened to this woman, more mass shootings, more assault victims, the woman in the Uber vehicle who, you know, the gentleman locked her in and tried to assault her. We're seeing more of that now that things are kind of returning to normal. And so it brings us back to a point that it's important to have a plan of action. One in three women will be assaulted in their lifetime. There's three of us right now on this screen. One in three will be assaulted in their lifetime. Think about that. You really dive into that. Now, maybe you already experienced something and you're like, yeah, and you understand the intensity and the trauma that comes with that kind of event. Maybe you have it. Do you want to roll the dice and find out, well, maybe I won't be one of the one and three, so I don't need a plan. No, you need to have a plan. And the best way to not be one of those people is to have a plan. 
it goes back I mean, we think about kids and bullying. And for many years, I also taught kids martial arts and stranger danger, as well as bully prevention seminars. And one of the number one things you see in a bully is they tend to look for the weaker victim, the easy person, the person that's not gonna complain in schools. The bully picks on the kid that's, that people aren't gonna stand up for. He picks on the person that he's not gonna get in trouble for picking on. The bully doesn't go up to the tough kid that's you know the most popular and the most you know whatever and start there. No, because they know they'll be rejected and whatever it is that they're looking for from that event, they're not gonna get. Well, the same thing applies as we move into adulthood. Attackers are looking for people that they can attack and get away with it. So if you have strength and confidence in your body language, if you learn to carry yourself and you have that mental plan, it changes how you carry yourself. They don't want to be involved. They don't want to get caught. And the only time that situation may apply differently is when you have someone who has an excessive uh, amount of drugs in their system. And at that point, what's controlling their actions is different than our normal aggressor or someone who has severe mental health issues. And again, in both those situations, that is a totally different scenario than your average aggr aggressor or attacker. So most of what I'm talking about right now does deal with when it comes to the psychology of it, deals with our average aggressor, but the techniques we're gonna teach will apply to any situation. There are a lot of myths when it comes to self-defense. And this is a real big thing for me because I get asked these questions all the time, both working with men and women. And quite frankly, whenever I post anything on social media about a seminar or self-defense, one of the first responses I'll always see is, and you can probably guess, go get a gun which, you know, when it comes to self-defense can be a very practical way to defend yourself if you have trained on how to use a firearm. Because the reality of it, depending on what state you're in and what the requirements are, there's not a lot of training when it comes to having the right to carry. So, you know, someone will say, well, just take an LTC course. I take an LTC course. And while I learned about the importance of taking care of my gun, gun safety, making sure it's locked, um, awareness with the gun, et cetera, at no point was I taught what to do if I have a gun in my purse and someone charges me and I have to defend myself. I wasn't practicing shooting under stress and duress, which is a very different situation than target practice. So while a lot of people count on this gun as a way to save their life, in stress, you may, and someone's charging you, and you got, I mean, I have a hard enough time finding my keys in my purse when they're on top, okay? You think when I'm suddenly scared for my life, I'm going to be able to find my gun, never mind have the calculated ability to pull it out, aim, and do what I have to do before any threat escalates more? Maybe, maybe not, but I'm not going to count on that alone. So, you know, when it comes to that, you can't count on that alone, and the reality is, those who train at a higher level, they don't. They know that, 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 that there's so many things that could still go wrong. The other thing is pepper spray. And again, that, that's a great thing to have if you've trained on how to use it. Because if you've never sprayed pepper spray before, you don't know how it feels. You don't know, you know the wind. What if the wind's blowing the wrong way and you end up getting pepper spray in your own face? You know, I worked with a few different police departments and we put seminars together in which they teach the women how to work with pepper spray and I teach the hands-on combatives. Because again, here's that purse and we've already talked about if you can find the pepper spray in time and it's possible, you're nervous, you're shaking and they get to you before you get it out or maybe you do get a little off and maybe that person keeps coming. It's possible that especially if there's drugs involved, that that person may just go right through or maybe you don't get a perfect aim and get it right in their eyes and in, in your nervousness, you spray their kneecaps. I mean, that's not gonna help you in that situation. So it's important to be prepared with the what's next. A self-defense course like this, which is awesome, it's amazing. You're learning techniques that are empowering you, that'll make you stronger, that'll give you the confidence and ability. But one self-defense seminar, 10 years later may not be enough to give you the situational awareness. I often think of, you know, if you took a foreign language in high school, you know, I took Spanish in high school and I could not have a conversation in Spain right now if I needed to. And, and so when you think of self-defense, it's kind of the same concept. If you took a course 10 years ago and now you have to defend yourself, maybe some of that stuff you'll be able to use depending on the situation, maybe not. Just like if I suddenly found myself in Spain having to navigate 
and with, with no Spanish speaking skills besides what I learned in high school, I'm going to have a really hard time having a way of life there. So it's important to realize that you need to have some form of continual training, whether it's once a year, twice a year, or ongoing weekly training. Excuse me one moment. <coughs> uh, I don't know why I turned here like I was going off camera because you can still see me cough, but uh, 911. That's the next one. Everybody has their cell phone on them, right? I'm not concerned. I can just call for help. Well, first and foremost, we'll rewind back to what I said before about being able to get it out in time. You gotta get that purse out and then you gotta open it. And even if it has facial recognition, like if you have sunglasses on, I don't know about you, my facial recognition doesn't recognize me fast enough. So now you're, you're trying to get the password thing to pull up and dial in the password. And then you still have to push the phone and get the 911 or maybe you get the emergency thing fast enough. But either way, there's still a time lapse that it takes you to actually dial for help. And there is response time for the police officers to get there because the reality is they're not in all places at all times. Even if a situation were to happen right in front of a police station, it still takes them how long to get out the door into you. There, there's anywhere from 20 seconds, like I said, if there's just happens to be a police officer right there to I've heard some response times in rural communities can run as high as eight to 12 minutes. What's gonna happen in that space of time? What are you going to be able to do to defend yourself in that space of time? Now, I do want to be clear, eight to 12 minutes is not an average uh, nationwide. I'm, I'm referring to rural communities where there, there are much larger areas and smaller populations of people. There are much shorter response times, I believe. The national average might be right around two minutes is what I heard uh, in more uh, city or densely populated areas. So I just want to be clear on that. But the point being, there's still something that you, the bad guy, the attacker doesn't go, oh, you called the cops? Well, I'll give you two minutes, all right? If they're not here by then, then we're gonna get back to this situation. But uh, I'll give you that two minute head start. Like that's not how it goes. The, the situation has already begun when you're in that kind of scenario. So calling for help is great, but you have to fill the gap. You have to fill the time. Another popular myth or common thing that I hear from people is like, oh, but I was told by my friend and you know, and there's a whole different different answers they'll say here. They might say, oh, my friend, he's a cop and he knows, or, oh no, I know someone who knows someone who is like, they deal with like real stuff. Like I'll hear this all the time, like the real stuff. I'm not really sure what the real stuff is, but they'll say that like the real stuff. And they told me I should just do this. Um, you know, another thing I've heard is, um, you know, I was told by someone and he served in the military. So like, he really knows what he's doing. I was told is not a self-defense plan. Or right? like, I was told you to put my keys in between my knuckles. How many punches have you thrown in your life? So hopefully you get lucky. Like, yeah, that'll do more damage to an attacker. But again, if you don't have the aggression and the confidence to follow through, knowing to put keys in between your fingers or using it as a whip or, or whatever these different little things you've heard is won't do anything for you. As I was preparing for this seminar, because while I've taught many, honestly, this is the first women's self-defense seminar I've ever done virtually. So I was like, I know a lot of people have been doing more of this. I want to get some ideas of ways I could structure it and make the most value for you, seeing we can't actually have that physical tactile experience. And to be honest, I was very uh, disappointed at the amount of impractical self-defense videos there are out there. And they were the first ones that came up on YouTube. And so some people might be like, oh, I know, like I watch these videos all the time. Some of these videos, you know, would not save your life and they would not protect you. Now, some of the techniques could be complementary or might work in one unique situation that went perfect, but they are not designed for 2021 where you have no idea what's coming at you. You have no idea. I mean, most people, they're saying now more and more people have actual training when they attack someone. So you don't know if that person took jujitsu their whole life as a kid. So that move that you learned from that video may have no value at all because they already know the counter to it. So getting that false sense of security because you're watching these videos. I remember one that was like, oh, there's a pressure point right here. Like, yeah, that stuff is complimentary. That is not at all what you should hang your hat on when it comes to self-defense. So there's a lot of misinformation out there. Um, and then finally, we also said others, you know, we count on the idea of, you know, oh, well, I'm always with these other people and I'll be fine. 
And it's like, you're telling me there's never a moment you're on your own for any reason whatsoever. You need to be aware and think of the situation. Uh, the final one is, you know, people often say to me like, well, I don't go to any bad areas, you know, or I don't, I don't, I'm not worried. I live in a good, good community. I live, uh, you know, where, where I, I only go out during the day. I don't go at night. I don't go to bars. I don't go to sketchy areas. And I want to share with you another video um, from a Walmart parking lot of a woman who with her children was assaulted by someone who didn't want to put their cart away. I mean, you really don't know what you may deal with. So let me pull this up for us. And this is surveillance video starting right now. So here is the gentleman right here as I start the video. This is the woman's car. And uh, so basically he, you know, puts the car kind of behind her car, but not too much. And this is how it plays out. The woman's upset as she's coming across and she says to him, please move your cart. He says, no, they have people for that. And then what happens next? I'll let you watch out. She has children, one, two kids. He assaults her. The baby carriage goes over here. She continues to aggress towards him, despite the fact that her children are in this situation here. The daughter runs across the parking lot. She ends up getting taken down by the gentleman. And what's scarier is what could have happened to that baby. And this is how long it takes before anyone even sees the situation and gets involved. And she continues to try to block him in, to try to keep him from leaving. Other people do. So the situation itself, all right, breaking it down. The woman's assaulted. It doesn't matter what the reasoning is, whether she was in the right or the wrong for approaching him that way. It shouldn't have happened. But when we're talking about our own personal safety, first and foremost, when you are with your children especially, do not enter into a confrontation. In those moments, you're not just responsible for your own life. She had two young children with her. And thank God someone wasn't backing up their car in another lot, not a spot seeing what's happening. Someone didn't come across that something worse did not happen to one of her children in that moment when she felt this overwhelming need to educate him on where he should put his cart. There are some things in life that just aren't worth the risk because you have no idea how that person would respond. She didn't know that when she decided to, you know, give him grief for not putting his cart away, that this was the guy that was gonna assault her, that this was the guy that was gonna come at her. And she had a responsibility to protect not just herself, because again, like we said at the beginning, we're all responsible for our protection, but her children in that moment. So being aware of your situations, understanding that, you know what? Unfortunately, in the day and world that we live in, it's not a good idea to decide to start a confrontation with a complete stranger based on their actions. And it's unfortunate that people behave that way, but that doesn't mean it's worth your personal safety or someone else's personal safety. And the other thing about this is it was a normal errand at Walmart, right? This wasn't her in a sketchy neighborhood. This wasn't her, you know, off partying and no wonder she got in trouble. This was her with her children running her regular grocery store activities and an assault happened. My mother was getting gas in the middle of the afternoon in a nice neighborhood. And while she was pumping gas, someone came up with a knife to her to mug her. Now, thankfully, my mother's black belt and trained in self-defense, and she was able to de-escalate the situation and get herself to a safe place to call for help without having to, uh, without actually even losing any money or being assaulted. Um, you know, and, and so I'm very glad that that went that way. My mom had the training. My own people who introduced me to the martial arts, and if you're from the New England area, you may have read this story, I think it was six or seven years ago. Uh, again, nice neighborhood on the Connecticut, Massachusetts line. They were driving and noticed there had been a car accident, um, pulled over to help the people, and it turned out that they ended up becoming victims themselves of a carjacking incident. The people that they pulled over that had been in this accident to help had actually just stolen a car. So the girl tries to jump in the car, begging for help. They're a little disoriented and they re re recognize right away something isn't okay as they turn. The boyfriend comes at the mother with a knife. 
And because of her training, she was able to defend herself and get out of the car. The daughter also had to use self-defense techniques. She ended up being cut down the side of the head. Both of them, um, though they did get away safe in their lives, they're alive today because they knew how to defend themselves, but they both needed medical attention because they were cut with these knives. So again, it doesn't matter where you are or what's happening, a risk could come. And knowing how to defend yourself is an incredibly important, and knowing how to read situations is incredibly important. The first thing I wanna teach you about is your gut instinct. Because the reality of it is most situations can be avoided if you learn how to trust your gut, okay? If you learn how to read a scenario, if you learn how to be aware. I'm sure we can all say at some point or another, you had that feeling of something just like mm, uneasy. I'm not comfortable right now. I'm not really sure why. Doesn't make complete sense to me, but something's not okay here. That is our gut telling us to beware. And the thing is, as women, believe it or not, I think our gut is even more in tune. Like they call it a woman's intuition. And the, the reality of it is we don't listen to our gut. A lot of times, many reasons we talk ourselves out of it. Like, I'm fine, or we worry we might offend somebody, or, you know, we get too much in our own heads to saying, hey, I'm not comfortable right now, and I'm not sure why, but I'm going to listen to that feeling. I'm going to challenge you that if you ever get, and, and I explain it this way, there's the green light scenario, where nothing feels off, nothing's wrong, right? There's yellow. Yellow is when something feels a little, mm, you don't really have a real reason why, but something's off. In those situations, evaluate the scenario, evaluate what's going on and ask yourself, is there a reason you're feeling this way before you make your next decision? The next one is red. Red is when you just know, get the hell out of here. I mean, you have no doubt, but the problem is we don't listen to those feelings when we have them for many, many reasons, whether it's because, you know, most women and things are changing, which is wonderful, but as girls, most of us are raised to what? Respect authority be polite, have dignity and grace. Don't, you know, don't cause a scene. You know, we're not taught to, to listen to our gut, to trust ourselves and to be okay with our decisions. If you enter an area and you feel uncomfortable, leave. I'm not telling you to cause a scene. I'm not telling you to offend somebody. I'm not telling you to be like, I just want everyone to know I'm really uncomfortable with something right now. And this is why you don't have to make an announcement. Just listen to yourself and leave. I would rather trust my gut, leave, and have been wrong than ignore my gut, stay, and be right. And I'm blessed that I have never uh, had a situation where I physically didn't trust my gut. But I can tell you, in business and in life, the biggest mistakes I ever made was because I ignored that gut feeling in that moment. That when something said, mm, this business partnership isn't right, or this business move isn't right. I said, you know, I'm just probably just exaggerating. And I just wrote it off. And then later I looked back and I said, I knew in that moment, I knew and I ignored it. But don't, especially when it comes to your personal safety. So once you learn to trust your gut, okay? And you are aware and you get out of that situation, Okay, the next step is what if you can't or what things should you look for? And I'm going to pull up some of my notes as I go through this. So some things to have to, in consideration just every day. First off is to always have a hand free at all times. Now, this can be challenging, especially if you have kids or, you know, the uh, old I can get all the grocery stores into one trip thing. Right. So being aware of your situation, being mindful that like, hey, if I had to defend myself and I'm carrying all this stuff and I'm in my high heels in an awkward outfit that doesn't make it easy to move with to begin with, how easy is it for an ass assailant to take advantage of me in that moment? So being aware that should you have to, just having that mobility. And guess what? That mobility doesn't just apply to what if I'm attacked or what if you fall? What if something were to happen? I mean, having a hand free applies practically to the practicality of many, like how do you open the car door without dropping things? Having that hand free is a good thing, no matter what the situation is. Uh, make deliberate, uh, short eye contact with any potential threats. So it's not, you know, it's not like stare them down, but don't be like walking, popular, just walk with confidence. You know, the light eye contact, if you're concerned, make a quick 
short eye contact, be aware of where they are, be aware of your scenario, be aware of the exits in the room. Like when you walk in a room, do you pay attention to where the exits are? If something should happen, do you know how quickly you can evacuate? Do you know where to go? Take that into consideration. Um, plan in advance how you would react to different threats. So think about it, you know your routine. Okay, so if you know, okay, I usually park in this parking garage, I know where the exits are, so think like this is my walk. So if this were to happen, where would I go? What would I do? What, what strikes would I use? You know, what, what, do I have pepper spray? Do I have a weapon? Do I have a phone? How would I use that to defend myself? Keep those things in mind and, and kind of go over them in your head. If you go for a morning jog, where do you jog? How visible is it? Who knows where you go and when you go should you need help? Keep those things in mind, play it through in your head about how you would respond in those situations because it's gonna give you the confidence to not worry in those scenarios because you've already played it out. And then have a personal protection plan for escalation, escalating situations. So again, we talked about the best defense of all is the Nike defense. Let's get the hell out of there. Don't be there because all the techniques in the world that you still don't know. You know, you could start off with a defense, defend yourself, God pulls out a knife, God pulls out a gun. Situation is now escalated, so what happens next? Are you prepared to continue defending yourself should the situation escalate? Are you prepared and ready to keep fighting with everything you have until the threat is neutralized? And that is something you have to really, really think about in your mind because there is no one technique. Not, I'm gonna show you, you know, groin kick and eye gouge, but the reality of it is, someone comes at you, you might get lucky, throw a groin kick, and that kick might have them like on the ground, or it might just give you the small short circuit in their brain to do the eye gouge and another move and run away. Or maybe it's someone that just keeps coming or grabs you and you fall in the fight and you have to have the ability to keep going. Maybe they have a friend. There are many things you have to consider and you have to consider your attitude and willingness to keep fighting no matter what, okay? Some community ideas for self-defense. So first off, you, as I mentioned before, you want to walk with confidence. We don't want to walk like a victim. And that's hard. It's something you have to conscientiously think of. One way that I do this and keep it in my mind, because like everyone, I get distracted, is always thinking when I walk through a doorway, pull the shoulders back. Okay? Because we all get in our own heads. We forget what we're doing. We're kind of in our own zone. And the more we're there, the more our bodies kind of collapse. The assailant and someone that's going to an attack is looking for someone who's distracted, who's not confident, who looks like an easy prey. Don't be an easy prey. Carry yourself with the strength. I mean, look at the animal kingdom. Which animals are the ones at the top of the food chain? Which animals even in, in the, oh my goodness, I'm gonna have a pack or, or whatever it is. The strong ones are the ones that survive. The ones, and you can see it right away. Why? Because of their body language. Their body language says strength confidence. It says, I'm not easy to kill. Carry yourself with that kind of confidence and attitude. Develop a habit of raising awareness and being sure you use, uh, have both of your hands and feet. So like I said before, make a habit of it. Ask yourself, you know, if you're wearing heels, you know, being aware of how you move in those shoes, you know, if you're wearing a skirt, you know, does this change your mobility? How would, you know, keep those things in mind. You know, I like wearing fun clothes and, and heels, etc. But whenever I put them on, I think about where am I going? What am I doing? You know, how, how realistic, if I had to defend myself, can I from here? And, you know, I don't go through it in a, oh man, I'm not going to have any fun tonight kind of way, but I just have an awareness and having that awareness and carrying myself with that confidence makes a world of difference. Have you, um, have your keys ready, but invisible when approaching your car. So instead of like, you know, you know, oh, you're texting while you're walking and then you get to your car and then you're like digging, where are my keys, in my pocket? Oh yeah, let me check here again. That time there, if there is an attack room in the area, makes you a victim while you're distracted. So when you finish up your shopping, your work or whatever, just have your keys ready. It's a very simple thing, you know right where they are. So it takes down the time and makes you less likely to be someone they're gonna go for. Um, have to, uh, Always approach your car with a heightened sense of awareness. In a parking lot, uh, depending on where that parking lot is, that's oftentimes a great opportunity for attackers because they know your hands are going to be full. They know you're going to be distracted. And depending on where you park, you may have put yourself in a very uh, low visible area that makes it even easier for them. So on that topic of a parking lot, don't park you know, in a cornered area where you can easily be blocked in. 
don't park, make sure you're in a place where uh, security cameras, et cetera, are visible. So should you need assistance and whatnot, um, it's easy for you to get the help you need. So closer to the door if you can, and then don't be scared, especially at night, uh, no matter where you go, to ask someone from the place you work to walk you to your car. You know, as a self-defense expert with many years experience, I still do this. And I remember uh, one of my friends owned a place I used to frequent and, you know, he would laugh. So I was like, hey, I don't want to walk me in my car. And he'd laugh because he used to take classes from me to train on self-defense. And here I am, you know, but you want to walk me to my car? Just because it's safety. When there are more people, it's less likely for someone to try to take that opportunity, to try to make that move. Um, when uh, you are traveling, consider making sure packages aren't visible in your car. So if you're going in and out of stores and someone walks by and they see, you know, all these big bags and packages, well, now that's a temptation for someone to be like, hey, this might be someone that's got some money. I might get something out of them. And they're more likely to target you. So be aware of those things. Uh, make sure they're covered. You know, make sure even when you're traveling that your purse or your wallet is not visible. So should someone walk by the car or pull up? They're not like, oh, yeah, all right, you know, there we go. If you should be in a parking spot and your car is bumped, do not immediately jump out of the, the vehicle ready to, like, yell at the person or file the insurance claim. First, assess the situation because that's actually a very common form of a trying to get you out of your car is, is faking an accident. And in the meantime, as you're jumping out of the car, they've already intended on, on their what they're going to do next. So just, you know, Assessing the situation, if you're not feeling comfortable, make sure the car door is locked and call for help then. Um, when approaching your car, have a plan with your kids. You know, you don't want to scare them, but you know, you can even say, make it a game. You know, hey, if mommy says this, you get in the car real fast and lock the door. You know, something so that if you should be in a situation where you know there's danger and you want to keep your kids safe, they know that this, this word means get in the car. And again, we don't want to have our kids scared all the time either. So you can make it a fun game without telling them that, you know, this is what you do in case something bad happens. You know, you know your children, their age, and at what point it's appropriate to talk about these things. So that's something you would have to make the decision on on your own, but have a plan with them. Make sure they're prepared. If someone threatens you with a weapon, gun, knife, you have your car, money, whatever they're asking for, immediately. Most of the time, that's all they're looking for, especially if they're looking for money drug, uh, money for drugs. They don't really want to get beyond there. They're not looking for an altercation. They're looking to move on. So if someone does threaten you with a knife and they're like, give me your money or a gun, like, give me your money, your car, whatever, give it up immediately. Don't try to, you know, uh, escalate the situation. Again, think of the woman in Walmart, you know, the same kind of thing, you know, and that's a different scenario, but you never know how far it's going to go. And if you can easily... Uh, give them what they're looking for, that's better than finding yourself in a situation where, you know, the situation escalates. And one of my locations was actually located next to a coffee shop, and they were held up at knife point at one point. Again, great neighborhood in Shrewsbury. They were busy, peak of day. Someone just came right behind the counter, came right up to the cashier, put a knife right up to her and said, give me all the money in the drawer. She Froze because first off, she didn't even know where the guy came from because why the restaurant's busy, packed with people. Nobody saw what was going on because it just looked like someone was talking to her. She was wise, gave him the money, and she was in such shock she didn't say anything until after he left. Less than a week later, the same kid tried to do it again. This time, as he stepped away, she yelled, That's him. And an off duty police officer was able to stop him. But my point being, is that usually if you're able to give them what they're looking for, they'll end the assault there. Uh, let's see, let's see. All right, so that's all on those tips. So let's talk a little bit now about, we, we talked about situational awareness. We talked about the importance of knowing where the exits are, walking with confidence, and uh, you know, just the different safety tips that are important for your own personal protection. So what happens if the situation escalates? First off, now this is a crazy drill that you're going to think that it sounds odd. I want you to do later is I want you to look in your own mirror and start making strong eye contact with yourself. Now, this is very uncomfortable. Even when I first started doing it, I'm like, this is so weird. But it changes how you carry your body. Someone approaches you and you're uncomfortable. And quite honestly, if you don't know them and they're just coming into your, your bubble without an invitation, that right there to me is like, uh-uh, I don't know who you are, but you better back off. So the first thing you want to do is you want to have the confidence to make sure 
that you're going to stand up and tell them to. So should someone come and approach you, first thing you want to do is you want hands up open near the face, elbows in. We don't want to go right to a fist because there is a possibility that this person coming into your bubble may not be an aggressor. But as soon as we go to fist, it might change the scenario. So we don't want to go fist. What we want to do is just here, our hands are up, and immediately, loud, strong, authoritative voice, hey, back off, stop right there. The person should, should any normal person will be like, whoa, 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 hey, I, I just had a question, right? They're going to stay outside your bubble. Someone who has intent is going to continue moving forward. You give the second warning, I said stop. They don't stop, you know you're in trouble, okay? Now, at that point, you have to make a decision. Do you have time to run to safety? Can you get help? Or are you going to have to use your physical body to defend yourself? So that what well, you're going to have to already, it's the importance of having assessed the scenario is let's, let's take a moment. We're in the parking lot of the grocery store and someone's approaching us. If you've already assessed your scenario, you probably already saw this person. So you're already aware of them before they even started cold, coming close enough to come into your bubble. Now you should be aware, like, are you between them in the car? Is there space for you to run and escape? Where's the uh, entrance to get into the grocery store if you need to? All of those things should be things that you've assessed and are aware of. They continue to come in. We want to think of what we call a holy grail of Krav Maga, the groin and the eyes. Doesn't matter if they're male or female ladies. I don't know if you ever had a hit to the groin. I have, my knees went down too. It's just, I think we're a little better at hiding it. So, you know, people don't get as much of a kick at, kick, come on, I get it, of trying to kick us in the groin like we do with boys. Um, but the idea is it hurts, okay? It doesn't matter if you're male or female. So a kick to the groin will short circuit you, uh, short circuit them. So the idea is they're coming in full intent. You throw that kick to the groin. Now it may slow them down, it may stop them, or it just might make them stutter. The idea is they started the altercation. They already have the advantage on us. They, they went first, they made the first move. So we basically have to use our opportunities to overwhelm their senses. So from here, as they come in, as I throw that groin kick, from here, what I want to do is go for an eye gouge, straight to the eyes, okay? Taking out their ability to see. Now, you may or may not get the eye gouge. Back to what I said earlier, just because you know groin kick and eye kick doesn't mean you're going to hit with accuracy. Maybe you go for the eyes and they back up and you barely scrape them, okay? You still have them moving off balance. You still have them moving off center. And you have to be able to continue to move forward with that fight and overwhelm their senses and neutralize the threat until the fight stops. So the techniques that I'm showing you today are the groin kick and the eye gouge. So the first idea with a groin kick, it's like I mentioned before, the most sensitive part of the body. And we want to take our strength, okay, to their weakness. So even if it's a six foot five guy who's like built like an MMA fighter, his weakness is still in his groin. As a matter of fact, if you ever watch any professional fighting, groin strikes are illegal. And if they get hit in the groin, they actually get a break to recover before they go back to the fight. So it tells you a little bit about how it does affect a fighter because if it wasn't that serious, they would just be like, all right, you're good, keep going. Instead, you know, they're pummeling each other, hitting each other with KO power, but make the groin, okay, everyone take a break. Okay, so you know that it has an intense uh, power behind it. So we're also taking the strongest part of our body, which is our legs, the largest muscle group in our body, no matter what size you are, this is your strongest part of your body, and we're using it against their weakness. Our hips, the hinge, our butt is, our, again, the largest muscle group, so we're using the leg power, the butt, the hips, and thrusting that upwards with the shin, which is basically like a nice baseball bat. You think a Louisville slugger attached to your leg, right up into their groin. So what you're gonna do is you wanna use the power of your hips. So we're not lifting with our leg, we're using all of this motion here to generate the power. So I'm using that hip and I'm shooting straight up into that groin. So I'm gonna take it from a couple different angles. So just, as you see, from here, and then just another angle here, so you can just see the hip engagement. Okay, straight up into the groin with power and intensity. After that, I don't wait. I'm not gonna throw a groin kick and be like, that hurt? Okay, no, overwhelm the senses. We're just, we're just go. Once you start, once you engage, you don't stop. You are like a cat in a bath, okay? Except with focused intent. If you ever try to give a cat a bath, they don't like move and then be like, ooh, did that work? Ooh, did that No, they're just, you, you cannot figure out. I once had to give a cat a bath many years ago and that thing was up my arm, down, and I could not manage this little eight pound cat. That is who you need to be, okay? So from here, we have our groin kick. Then we come in 
with our eye gouge. So our eye gouge, we splay our fingers, and we are, to be pretty uh, on point here, we are literally trying to come out with souvenirs, okay? We are trying to remove their ability to see. You're not just like trying to poke lightly. You are following through with everything you have. You go left and right, just in case we miss with the first, we have a higher probability of removing their vision with the second one. So groin hat to the eye strike. And from here, with continued training, you would have more tools in your toolbox, but you can do palm heel strikes. So that's using the meaty part of the hand to continue striking to the face and the eyes. Your elbows are so powerful. Uh, I actually uh, tell people I have a slight permanent black eye from not someone hitting me with an elbow, from their elbow bumping into me. So there's like no power, very light graze. But my point being, that's how strong your elbow strikes are. So imagine if you were to strike someone with intent for an elbow strike, you know, knee strikes, just coming in and repeatedly striking face, groin, nonstop in order to defend yourself. And that is the attitude you have to have. It has to be a go, 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 nonstop mentality. It cannot be a, you know, oh, I learned these two techniques in the self-defense class and I think I'm good now. It has to be like, dude, they come, I'm going at it too. And I am not stopping until I know I am safe. Your life is worth it, okay? Your life is worth learning how to defend yourself and how to fight back. Now, oftentimes I will sometimes get from people, the thing is, well, and I saw this actually on Twitter last year um, and I did reply, the person didn't reply back. And they said, I shouldn't have to learn to defend myself. The world, you know, the world should be a better place or men shouldn't do this or et cetera. And you know what? I agree. We shouldn't have to, but I get to, first off, I get to, and that's an important thing because I want to say like when I first started martial arts back about 25 years ago, it was still very unpopular, uncommon to have a girl in class. Okay. It was becoming more acceptable. But when I was a kid, like I, girls didn't do karate. That was a boy thing. And then before that, girls were never taught to fight. Now we are allowed to learn to fight. We are allowed to learn to defend ourselves. And whether it's right, wrong, or indifferent, the whole process, that doesn't matter. You have the ability to get out there and learn to fight back and defend yourself. And there are still places in the world where that is not allowed. So I'm going to embrace my freedom. No, I should not have to defend myself. And I hope to never have to use the skills that I know to physically defend myself. Because I understand that there is always a risk in that situation. I get to. And I'm proud that I get to. And I'm going to learn. And I'm going to train. And I'm going to empower other women to do the same. Because again, you are the only person responsible for your safety. You know, back to the Uber story we shared earlier about the woman in the Uber car. And uh, this happened here in Massachusetts, I believe. You know, she was driving, felt uncomfortable. Uh, he had, she asked him to stop the car. He locked her in and began to crawl over to assault her. And thankfully, she was aware of her situation. She had paid attention and she was able to escape, but it could have escalated into so much more. The reality of it is though, most Ubers are safe. Most of the time, you do not have to worry about your Uber driver trying to attack you. But if you should find yourself in that situation, would you rather be trained or untrained? Would you rather be prepared or hope for the best? I would rather be prepared. I hope this seminar has helped you ladies with just some different situational techniques and abilities to uh, just, you know, be aware of your surroundings, understand the kind of threats out there, and also understand the kind of personality you have to have to be a fighter to go for it and have the willingness to continue training. Um, I will be sending out an email later. If you would like to do continued training, I do offer both in-person training uh, in Webster. I only offer morning classes at this time, uh, 930 in the morning on Tuesdays and Thursdays. Uh, I don't foresee offering any regularly scheduled evening classes at any time uh, in the near future. I, I do have um, one son still in school and I just, I want to be available for those moments. So while I do schedule, you know, personal trainings or women's self-defense seminars on occasion in the evening, I don't schedule anything regular right now. Um, I am also have a completely virtual Krav Maga self-defense program. So if you're unable to come to Webster, like I mentioned at the beginning, I have an option where you can either do the on-demand Krav Maga training or uh, virtual where it's still interactive, similar to this uh, video here is. 
And then finally, I also offer, um, like I, I can be hired to come and do a women's self-defense seminar for small groups or large groups, depending on what you're looking for, or even personal training packages in which I can come and work with someone exclusively on their self-defense needs. Uh, feel free to reach out to me. I'm going to check the questions now. Hopefully I can uh, answer a couple of them before we jump off. And if you're in the same area I'm in, enjoy this beautiful weather. Let's see. Yes, Robin, that's right. I'm looking forward to having you. And Claire, thank you guys so much for jumping in. Um, I really enjoyed teaching this. You know, one thing you can do that would mean a lot to me if you enjoyed the seminar is if you go to my Diamond Self-Defense Facebook page, you can uh, just leave a review that you love the seminar and it was informative. That's just, you know, your, uh, your, <laughs> your, don't keep it a secret. You putting it out there is just a huge way for helping me grow my business and my goals. And that means a lot. So uh, thank you ladies very much. I do offer a free Facebook group. You can see in the chat box where it says Facebook groups in which I offer a bunch of different things, but every week I do come in and offer self-defense tips health and fitness tips, as well as just some other fun topics uh, that we as women talk about because I don't want the group to be all doom and gloom. I do sometimes talk about, you know, skincare tips or something funny that happened or motivational content, you know, because again, like I mentioned before, we don't want to walk around every day on eggshells scared of being attacked. We want to walk with confidence.